good government. Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good? Yep. Sweet. So, um, my air conditioner has not turned off in about six hours. <laughs> it feels like it because it's nice in here, man. Oh, yeah? You think so? I'm still I, I like do. a little sweaty. I can't get it down to the temperature I have it set at. I have it set at 71. It can't get down past 73. Oh, wow. So, you know, of course, that's like 30 degrees below what it is outside. <laughs> exactly. I am like, I can feel the vent though right now. Like where I'm sitting, oh, yeah, well, it's blowing on me. Yeah, and like on we the were, back of your neck. Exactly. And then <laughs> when we were in the kitchen wanna talking. want to switch sides? No, nah, I'm good. I'm happy right here. Yeah, when we were talking in the kitchen, like I know where the spot to stand in the kitchen. Yeah. I was spending a lot of time there. <laughs> <laughs> so smart man yeah. smart man i mean you it, when you live in the south you learn where the air conditioning is at well, that's, true. that's true like i can like do you. the same thing at my store like i know where to stand in the store to catch the breeze well yeah and your whole day is planned uh, it's like moving from uh air conditioning oasis to air conditioning <laughs> oasis exactly <laughs> calculate how much time you might have to be without air conditioning exactly uh, well um th- actually uh, i was thinking this is not going to be a climate change episode. We'll have to, I mean, we'll, we'll get to that again eventually, but, yeah. um, that's going to take a whole episode when we do I w- it. Yeah. I was noticing that all over the news over the last few weeks, it's been, um, that, you know, extreme heat warnings all over, you know, covering some huge percentage of the United States, extreme heat warnings, extreme heat warnings. Yep. And so I finally looked up what an extreme heat warning was. Yeah. And it's um, anywhere that the temperature is over 90 degrees. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh. We've been under one of those literally all summer. <laughs> yeah. And we are every summer. Well, uh, that's not I new. Mean, yeah. yeah. So that's not new. That's yeah. what I was thinking of is like I, they're making such a big deal out of it now. Like it's something unusual. And maybe there's parts of the country where it is unusual. And But yeah. here I've always told people that we get we get four months of 98 degrees and 100% humidity. Yeah, yeah. And it's not really hyperbole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's part of living in the South. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I wish we'd get some rain right now. It seems like it usually rains more it than it has. It seems like but... this summer has been a little drier for us. Yeah. And I'm, I wouldn't say like a lot drier, mm-hmm. but definitely drier. But yeah, I, I think it's been drier too, but it hadn't been hotter. And no. the And sometimes the, the rain is worse. Oh, it's worse a lot of the time. <laughs> if it doesn't, if it doesn't rain until the sun goes down, then it's just like a sauna out oh, there, yeah. like like literally like yeah. A sauna and out so there. many days you'll catch that mid afternoon shower, but mm-hmm. it'll go away and the sun will come back out. And, <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude, you yeah. don't want to be in that. It's worse. No, it's it's miserable. <laughs> it's worse. So even the cat agrees. She Absolutely. never goes outside. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> she does like to hang out next to the window. Windows don't entirely block the heat here either. It's no. like a it's like a wrestling match between the AC and the dude. That's the why in my outside. house we put out the blackout curtains like that, like shields some of the heat. But like I'm looking at your window now, you ain't even got a curtain in that bad boy. I know you're I, just I, letting that sun come on in. Well, it uh, so the sun doesn't much come in through the back. Okay. I, like I have shades on all shades of my front, front windows. Yeah, uh, I don't have shades on my back windows. the The truth is that. It, like I could absolutely live in the dark. I'm I'm a total vampire in that way. Yeah. Um, you know my. It'll, it'll save on your heating and cooling bill. Yeah. Well, my, <laughs> you know my parents, both of them, my mom now, um, used to complain about how dark it was in my house when they came over. I'm like, why is it so dark in here? I don't know. Does it, does it seem dark to you? I like it like this. <laughs> yeah. uh, I can't. I can't let my. My poor skin be exposed to any kind of light. <laughs> or you'll turn into dust. Yeah. Sensitive. Yeah. Um, all right. So I, I guess we're we're just like continuing on down the path of the Bill of Rights stuff. Yeah. Um, not one at a time this time because Third Amendment don't feel like it's going to take a lot of time. Although yeah. I, I have what I think anyway is kind of an interesting... Um, Spin on it. Yeah. So the Third Amendment is about quartering troops, and it it says that um, that 
the U.S. government can't quarter troops in private homes um, under any, well, without consent during peacetime and without some kind of legislation to back it up during wartime. Yeah. Like, there has to be, like, they have to come up with a, the legislature has to come up with some kind of rules about quartering troops during wartime, but yeah, um, no quartering without consent during peacetime. Yeah. But to me, the uh, expansion of the surveillance state kind of imp- imposes itself on that a little bit. Uh, part of the thing about quartering troops was that was the ability to um, see meetings, visitors, basically activity. have an, an embedded spy. Yeah, yeah. Any activity going on in a home is witnessed by agents of the government. Yeah. And we have that now without having to quarter troops. Oh, yeah. And so I, I think that there's, I don't know, I would like to see a reimagining <laughs> or a re, I don't, I don't want to say reinterpretation because I, I, that was part of the original interpretation. Yeah. Um, but I, I had never considered that. I had always just thought that the reason we had that amendment was to keep like because times were different then and you know soldiers had to travel around and the idea of a soldier just showing up to your house one day or a platoon of soldiers and being like we got to live here for a week while we regroup yeah give us room and board yeah exactly like yeah. i kind of liked being protected from that but like i feel like it was a different time and that was mm-hmm. the reason it was written in there i hadn't really interpreted the way you just have and it's interesting it's i hadn't just not something i had considered yeah, I, I I think that it's an important I, I think it's an important aspect of it, and it and it feeds right into the Fourth Amendment that we wanted to talk about as well, which is the mm-hmm. the uh, codification of the right of privacy yeah. um, that says that you were uh, protected in your um, oh n- now I can't remember the specifics for some reason, but <laughs> it's uh, your um, your person, your residence, your papers, and your effects, essentially. Yeah. Uh, person, property, pa- papers, and effects, or something like that. Sounds right, yeah. Um, against unreasonable searches and seizures. And they say in order for a search and seizure to be reasonable, it needs all of these things. <laughs> yeah. Um, all at once. All at the same time, yeah, right? The, it, it's and language. It's not or. Yeah. So it says it requires a warrant with probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and specifically identifying what they're looking for and where they expect to find it. Yeah. And where they'll look, essentially. Yeah. Um, and all of those additional phrases have to be true in order for it to be a reasonable search and seizure, yeah. according to this amendment. Of course, this has been thrown out oh, yeah. long, long ago. Oh, yes. Um, now they just come in with a barrage, like for well, and and they use uh, they use private companies to do it instead, um, yeah. which you know, like uh, this has come up so much with the uh, with the First Amendment recently as well. The idea that the federal government can use a private company to do things that the federal government is not permitted to do, yeah. <laughs> is contrary to the whole idea of these limitations placed on the government. Yeah. Instead of the government subpoenaing you to see your text messages or your emails or whatever it is, they just go to the company and they don't just take yours. They take them all Mm -hmm. (laughs) and we'll, we'll get to them when we get to them. And of course we know from Snowden that the NSA is storing every single piece of data that travels over the internet and, um, you know, that they can go to at any time. Now, to me, even if they're not looking at it, that's still a search. Well, it's definitely a seizure. Oh, that's absolutely a seizure. <laughs> well, you can't dispute that. Um, but to me, it's still a search. Yeah. Even if they're not making use of the information. Uh, so, I mean, there's just supposed to be fundamental rights. And our our federal government has been ignoring them for decades, oh, at yeah, least. Oh, yeah, yeah. Past 20 years, hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and they continue to acquire more power in, in this regard as well. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if some time in the future, especially as militaristic as our government has become, and, and, and especially as they push uh, conflict with, with Russia, with China, with Iran, with North Korea, if the, the thing about, like, the literal issue about quartering troops becomes... 
an issue again? Yeah. Oh, it could. It absolutely could. Um, I mean, we feel so secure here with our oceans on both sides and, and relatively friendly nations in the north and the south. But, <laughs> yeah. um, but that could change. And, you know, we, uh, the, the way our government operates in the world, uh, imposing its will on everybody everywhere, we're seeing some backlash from that already. And it wouldn't, I mean, it would surprise me a little bit if it got into Canada in any real sense. Yeah. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if it got into Mexico. Oh, absolutely. In, in fact, it has already, I, I would suggest. But, yeah. um, you know, and especially if all the talk about uh, locking down the Mexican border and going after the cartels in Mexico with military force and, and so forth comes to fruition, that'll create some resentment. Oh, yeah. And so um, we may not always have a friendly neighbor to the south, is I guess what I'm suggesting. Yeah. And if we don't have a friendly neighbor to the south, what, you know, what steps might the government take to secure the border? Yeah. Might it be quartering troops in people's private homes along the southern border? Yeah. I think it could. Yeah. Well, in any if if the government was to lose its grip on power. Like, I mean, I don't think anybody would really dispute in this country right now that like the government has complete control over, over the people of this country. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's pretty cut and dry. Like there's, I mean, they may talk about, you know, different things, but it's, they've got control, but it may not stay that way. <laughs> like yeah. it's not, that's not like a foregone conclusion that it's going to stay that way. Well, that's, that's true. I mean, this is why we really need to push for decentralization. Um, just a, a more local government just doesn't have the ability, the wide-ranging ability or the, um, the bankroll oh, yeah. um, to, to oppress people in the same way that the federal government does. Yeah. I mean, right now they've got a blank check to do so. Yeah. Because, I mean, they, they run the printing press, you know. I was talking to some guys at the bar last night um, about the about the economy. Because so I started it off with, uh, they had Fox News on at the bar, I, but they didn't have subtitles on, and, you, and they didn't have so volume on. So I'm, on, all yeah. I'm doing is, like, reading the Chiron. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it was all this thing about Bidenomics, Bidenomics, Bidenomics. And I leaned over to the guy who was sitting next to me, and I said, uh, hey, man, I'm like, you know, I hate to inter interrupt you here, but... Can you explain to me why President Biden would want to take ownership of this economy? <laughs> what are you talking about? This has been the re best recovery in history. Well, I mean, it, that's kind that of what he said. <laughs> but he he did it like, I mean, he seems like a guy that actually is uh, dealing with numbers more than most. Yeah. Um, so he was actually talking about the statistics. He's like, well, the you know, all these indicator statistics look good. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. the GDP uh, has grown more than expected. Um, they've added however many millions of jobs since he took office. Oh, jobs are not the, a problem in this economy. Know, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the uh, employment rate is really high. Um, uh, inflation is way down. And I said, what? He said, yeah, inflation's down to 3.2. It was 9 point whatever when he took office. I was like, well, but yeah, but that 3.2 is on top of the 9. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what, uh, the, uh, that so irritates me. The rate me. of inflation is down, but inflation is still, still uh, yeah. I mean, for the people of this mm -hmm. country, if mm -hmm. inflation is going up at all, it's not good. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't, the inflation is bad for us. I think everybody can recognize that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, I said to him, like, okay, I, like, all right, fine. I understand your point here, but this isn't a good economy. Yeah. Right? Like, we're still on our way to a crash. You know, um, money like, supply expansion and credit expansion. Clearly on our way to a crash. Yeah. Like, I said money supply expansion and credit expansion never lead to a good place. And he was yeah. like, no, I, I understand what you mean. It's like if you were in your personal finances and you were like a million dollars in debt and you're like, well, I mean, but I've, I'm not, in, I'm not in adding as much debt every month as I was before. Yeah. Like that's not really an improvement, is it? Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's kind of my point. Yeah. Um, there was somewhere I was going, well, Oh, we came to the actual, uh, federal debt, um, yeah. at some point. And he was like, I, like I've even stopped keeping track of that. Like what 
it's just it's terrifying. Just, like it's just what, the number. Yeah. yeah. What is it now? It's like it's like thirty six trillion dollars. Yeah. Government's thirty six trillion dollars in debt. <laughs> yeah. And then I told him the Thomas Massey story. He knew who Thomas Massey was, so that was cool. Yeah. Um, and I'll tell that here, although I think I've told it on the podcast before, but I think it's funny. He was. Uh, this was years ago too, when the debt was like twenty three. <laughs> trillion or something uh, way back like yeah way, less like than eight 10 years ago yeah i was right? gonna say less than 10 years ago yeah. right <laughs> um but uh he he said he was at a diner and this story is probably it's a myth probably yeah. really it's just a funny story to tell but who knows might have happened um he was at a diner and uh you know he went to pay for his meal and he handed the waitress a card but instead of her his credit card, what he actually handed her was the her his representative card that they like plug into the desk when they're doing votes and so forth. Yeah. And so, um, you know, she went with the card and then she came back and she said, I'm sorry, sir, this was declined. It says it already has twenty three trillion in debt on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. Yeah. Um well that was just that went there for I don't know why. Uh I was going to say, though, uh, you know, back to the information thing, and you're talking about using the private companies, and we can use this transition to the next topic, is that the they're, like, now they're coming out that, um, that the government uh, did get a warrant or whatever for Twitter to release a whole bunch of private information from Trump's account during the January 6th thing, yeah, right, or something like that, yeah, um, including tweets that he never sent, and so but they also got, including they got everything. Yeah, but also including like who retweeted him and stuff like this, yeah. which is a little weird. Or liked his tweets or something. Mm -hmm. They and, compile um, in a list. And it included a uh um a requirement that Twitter not disclose to him that it had released that information. Hey, exactly. And you know, that's just I tell you, man, like that's scary. Yeah, like, I mean, there was a time when, at least, when you were being searched and having your property seized or your your information seized, you knew it. There was no way you could not know. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, to do it quietly seems like um, seems like a real frightening overreach and like very authoritarian step by the government. Absolutely. And uh, so I, I guess on that point, he was indicted for the fourth time a couple of weeks ago. Um, <laughs> yeah. I didn't check this, but I did see a graphic. And I swear I, I saw it on uh, Moon of Alabama, who's a German. So I, I'm, I'm inclined to believe that it's correct. Yeah. But I, where there was a timeline given that every time new information came out about the, the Biden um, corruption case or the yeah. uh or hunter's laptop or whatever a new um, indictment for a new Trump indictment came drops. out the next day yeah, yeah. like literally the next day I, i've heard that like i hadn't don't remember where but yeah I've, i didn't I, do the re i, yeah. I didn't double I check it to be sure that, but, since, but i've heard that yeah. but since it came from bernard at um moon of alabama i'm inclined to believe that it's probably correct yeah because he's just he doesn't he's, like Trump. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and he's got no he's got no dog in this hunt, you know. Yeah. It's just um but uh, anyway, so this new indictment came down in Georgia, which is probably the most significant of them. Prior to this, there was the one in New York for the misclassifying hush money payments to Stormy Daniels or whatever. Yeah. Um there are two federal cases uh, about January 6th and something else. Um I don't remember yeah. what. What's the other one? They're Do you just, remember? I don't, but they're just throwing indictments at him. And it's wild because, like, at the beginning of all of this, before the indictments started dropping, like, there was a decent chance that Trump wasn't going to be the nominee. Yeah. Like, I mean, there was there was actually some pretty, I mean, DeSantis, before he had announced, obviously, yeah. was polling pretty well in different people. But now it's like a foregone conclusion. <laughs> Yeah, because people... Um, They're rallying to him. It's the, well, that's part of it, but I think that they just uh, they identify with being chased around by the government. Yeah. Um, you know, just with spurious charges about who knows what. I mean, I think a lot of people in this country just feel like the government is out to get them. Yeah. And that he represents that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I say a lot of people in this country. I mean, people in this country that were already kind of 
skeptical. on his side. Yeah, yeah. Well, and skeptical of the government in mm-hmm. general. Which is how he got there in the first place. Oh, absolutely. Uh, skeptical of the government, skeptical of the media. Yeah. You know, feel like there's a, a system of oppression set up, yeah. which I don't think's wrong. No, I, I don't either. And um, um, and people people are identifying with him as somebody who's just like a victim of government overreach. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, like DeSantis sucked. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't. Yeah. I mean, I, mean I, I, I was really hoping that at some point we would get to talk about his job as a as an attorney for um, the U.S. military and his time at Guantanamo. Yeah. And really expose him as the bastard that he is. Yeah. I guess we don't get to this time around. <laughs> no. It, it's it's funny story with him because like he did do a good job during COVID. Yeah. In Florida. Well, he's one of those people that uh, he's where he needs to be. Yeah, and that's that's the right place. Yeah, I think know? that him being a governor of a state and using oh. that that authority to um, protect people in his state from federal overreach, that's a great place for him. That was valuable. Um, it was valuable during COVID. But he's a big... I, I said it from very early on when, when there was some momentum for him um, running, like bef- way before he announced and stuff. But when people started talking about, oh, DeSantis, DeSantis would be the guy. Yeah. Um, talked about it then, that he's a big believer in the surveillance state, the security state, the military state. Yeah. And so that's the kind of guy that I absolutely don't want in control of those aspects of our government. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, luckily it looks like he won't be. And, and he's, he's a warmonger too. Like, oh, he's, yeah. he's, he's on that I mean, side. He's been of, good on Ukraine mostly though. Has he? Because I haven't gotten a straight answer. Uh, I mean, maybe I have I'm just hearing. He seems evasive on the question every time I've heard it brought up. Yeah. Um, like he's kind of been walking the fence. Like he doesn't know what he wants to do yet. Yeah. That might be the case. I that's, might be that's I been, might be confusing him with somebody. That's or, been my, or only hearing one side of his, oh, or only remembering one side. It, it yeah. might be confirmation bias here. Yeah. Wow. Well. Uh, that's a, that's a possibility. Because uh, now that you mention it, I do think that in one of those debates, he said some stuff about the Ukraine war that I was like, eh, well. Uh, yeah. Well, and mm. Trump's already taken a solid, good stance on Ukraine. There wouldn't be a lot of reason for him to take the same stance that. Trump has taken. Okay, that's true, but Trump is also the first guy to give weapons to Ukraine. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I'm not saying he's a saint. I'm like, not saying and he, he's... he put a bunch of sanctions on Russia while he was in office, too. Now, yeah. you can make the argument that he did it because he was being accused of being a Russian spy yeah. um, the whole time that he was saying, no, 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 look, see how not a Russian spy I am? That I'm giving <laughs> weapons to their big enemy and that I'm uh, sanctioning Russia all over the place. See how not a spy I am? Yeah. But... But he did do those things. Oh, yeah. Like, this stuff started with him. Even Obama wouldn't give Ukraine weapons. <laughs> yeah. Well, And he, he was the man in charge when the, the um, Maidan coup happened in 2014 that the U.S. sponsored. Yeah. Well, I mean, it definitely started with Obama, but Trump fed into all of those yeah, as there president. There was a huge escalation with Trump as yeah. president. Yeah, I agree with that. In that area. Um, now, it, it's not comparable to Biden, obviously, but... yeah. Um, but we, you know, we can't absolve Trump on this oh, yeah. issue at yeah. all. Yeah. He, he's, you know, he took the first real steps Yeah. towards, towards a, a like a, a shooting like war. Like escalation. Yeah. 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 Big ex- escalation. Um, so, so anyway. What, so what do you think happens with any of this? Do you think they actually, or do you think that they're going to lock Trump up over any of these I don't know. Um, I, I don't have the legal expertise to to try really to. understand this or try and unwind it. I mean, my understanding from what I've read from uh, you know several sources is that a lot of these cases are really weak. Yeah, they all um, seem weak from what I've seen. Uh, the Georgia one is is kind of interesting though, for a couple of reasons. And I, I don't claim to understand the RICO stat. Just the fact that they're using RICO statutes, I think, is <laughs> yeah. is really interesting. But because in the indictment, from what I can tell, they identify a whole bunch of legal things that the Trump campaign did. Yeah. But then they wrap them all up and say because they knew that it was BS, therefore it is a conspiracy crime. Yeah. Um. 
I don't know. I, I think that that's a pretty weak argument too. Uh, the, of course, like a huge part of it hinges on the idea that Trump knew that he had lost. Yeah. And anybody does, who's does, seen Trump does over anybody these years, believe that he believes he lost anything ever in his life? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly right. So like that I man mean, doesn't believe he's ever that lost. That is one pompous sob right there. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, it's hard to it's hard to imagine that you can make any kind of case that he knew that he had failed. Yeah, that he did not actually think that he was a winner. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, and of course they, but, you know, they they leave out some aspects of it too. So they they're talking about specifically the phrase when he was on the phone with all those people, including the Georgia election people, and said, "You got to find me the however many thousand votes or whatever." Yeah. Um, but they leave out the part of the conversation where he's talking about that he he knows that there were hundreds of thousands of fraudulent votes and yeah. votes that should that were switched and votes that shouldn't have counted and so on and so forth and that the election was really close and so all you got to do is find fraud in this many yeah and exactly. it's not like he was telling them to go make stuff up yeah he was telling them that they just needed to do some investigation just it, enough investigation was, to to li- flip it listening to the what i heard of it 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 was that there's he was like there's way more fraud here than what I need to win. Yeah. Like, you know, all, all I need you to find is this much fraud. And I know that there was more than this. Right. Like, that's the context of that phrase yes. when he said that. Yeah. So, but um, it, at the end, though, what's, what's wild about this is, and what's interesting about it is that, you know, all they have to do is convince a jury of this. That's true. So it's, it, that's kind of how the rule of law works, you know, mm-hmm. like, I mean, it's not really whether you did it or not. It's what can we convince a jury of? Well, they have to convince the jury that he did these things and that it's against the law. Yeah. I, I mean, there's a little bit more of a, but you, a, then, then you've got to believe that you're going to find is criminal too. It's not civil. It's like beyond yeah. a reasonable doubt. It's not, yeah, but you're talking about putting a bunch of people on a jury that, you know, and nobody's... In Fulton in, County, Georgia. Yeah. Which is the, one of the more liberal ex- places in Georgia. Exactly. But even if it wasn't, you still got to find a group of impartial people to make an honest decision over something that there, you that person doesn't exist. <laughs> like, yeah. We've all lived under this the past 10 years or whatever. Like Yeah. You well, know. okay, so here's some other aspects of the Georgia indictment that I find interesting. Um, the Georgia indictment actually identifies things that happened in other states really? as part of the indictment. I didn't uh, realize they're, that. They're, yeah, they're trying to make the conspiracy case. So th- th- this was kind of a grand conspiracy. So um, some of the the actions of the people that they're trying to tie together into this conspiracy, um, some of the actions that they did in related to other states have been pulled into the indictment. Yeah. So you start to wonder like, well, why didn't they file charges in those other states? Yeah. And I don't know that this is the answer, but I can tell you some interesting things about the Georgia law related to this that I think may be contributing. Yeah. Um, One is that the, uh, in Georgia, the RICO statutes have a minimum five year prison sentence. Really? Okay, so if he's convicted uh, on these RICO statutes, it's a minimum of five year, um, five year sentence. Yeah. And and they've said explicitly that well, if he's convicted in a, a state case, he can't pardon himself, which is the concern. Yeah, if with he the wins, federal cases, if he wins the election, that he may just pardon himself. Yeah, um, he can't do that in a state case, and it has a five year minimum sentence. So if he's convicted, he can't stop himself from going to jail. But yeah. you may question then. Well, I mean. Can he you be got a pre- Republican governor. Yeah. You know, can the governor pardon him? First off, the governor has not been on his side. Um, yeah. But secondly, the answer is no. Yeah. Um, the governor cannot pardon him in Georgia. Really? Uh, and even the the board of uh, whatever it is, I forget um, their term for it, but the, the board of people over pardons and paroles and so forth, they can't pardon him either yeah. until five years after. After the sentence has been served. <laughs> so after he's done served. Yeah. So he can only be pardoned in Georgia. Um, after if he's convicted, he will serve five years in prison and cannot be pardoned until five years after that prison sentence is over. That's wild. Now, 
The other interesting thing is, as far as I can tell, there is nothing in the Constitution or anywhere else that prevents him from serving as president from prison. <laughs> now, now that would be fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I have these visions of him like walking the yard with a collection of Secret Service <laughs> Secret guys around Service him. I don't know. Just yeah, like on his phone or whatever. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, right. now, he'd have to be on one of their phones. Oh though, yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah, he's he's giving out nuclear secrets over a freaking. <laughs> Yeah. For cigarettes? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Trading nuclear coats for cigarettes. cigarettes yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, th- this whole thing That's... is so... It's so absurd. And But the, the thing that it... I don't know. The thing that can't be ignored here is that there has been kind of a gentleman's agreement or whatever um, for as long as the country has existed, as far as I know, yeah. that you don't, um, you you don't use you don't prosecute yeah, you your don't, predecessor. Well, or you don't prosecute your opponent. Well, that period. too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that seems to have been completely thrown out here, and I don't think that's a good precedent. Now, There's on the, on the other hand, of stuff I'd like them to start throwing the book at each other about, but yeah. none of the stuff that Trump did is it. <laughs> yeah. And now, yeah, on the flip side of that, I think it's Codswallop that you wouldn't prosecute a crime just because they're politically, uh, they're a political active. Yeah. Or I don't know what the right term there would be, but you yeah. know what I mean. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the other side of that, though, is that if you are selectively using the justice system to attack political enemies... I, that's just not that's not the country that I want to live in. No, I mean that's the exact same kind of thing that we complain about in other places. Oh yeah, yeah. Except for Ukraine. Yeah, all right. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. That's that's its own. Ba- like I would love to see all of these guys prosecuted for their crimes. Yeah. Like if you applied this equally, I would have no problems. Oh me either. Yeah. If we were going back and getting Obama and Bush and mm-hmm. Clinton and the like, whole group of them, like all, all of the them, living presidents, all the living presidents, like if they were all oh, being and, in start indictments started dropping. Yeah. Shoot, and your I'm all in. and your uh, yeah, you know, like all those guys, all oh the support God. staff. Yeah, and I'm all for boots, it. So I don't, I don't even care. Like I could name hundreds of people. Oh yeah. Oh, even like uh, um, Clapper and uh, Brennan and yeah. some of those guys. Man, I would love to see that. Yeah. But that doesn't happen. But that's And that's not what's happening now. And a lot of people mm-hmm. want to believe that this deal with Trump was, well, he's being, finally being held accountable. He's finally yeah. being held accountable, you know, um, with this assumption that he's done all of these things that he shouldn't be doing. Mm-hmm. But then when you start really looking at it and digging in, it's like, I mean, this guy's. I'm not saying he's a good guy, but he seems cleaner than any of the rest of them. Yeah. Well, and even think about that. The guy, he's like, what is he, 74 or something? Something like, like that? that, yeah. Um, he's in his mid-70s anyway. Yeah. He's been a public figure his entire life. Yeah, exactly. And he doesn't have a good reputation, and he never really did. No. I, but he's never been prosecuted before. No. But here in the space of however many months, there's been four indictments, yeah. and they're all timed to interfere with a campaign cycle. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's... You think it's, that was an accident? It's as blatant as it could be. Yeah. It would almost be a different scenario if after the election, and it still wouldn't be, but mm-hmm. you would at least be able to make the argument if after the last election, like immediately after they started like going after him for all of this election stuff. Like, I mean, we're what, two, three years removed from all of this now? And we're yeah. just now getting indictments? Mm-hmm. No, this is politically motivated and everybody knows it. That's the other thing is like, like whether you agree with it or not, even the people who like agree with it and are all for it, like they recognize what's going on here. Yeah. One of, one of them, I can't remember which one, I'm pretty sure is uh, slated to start the Monday before Super Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. Like this, it's very clear uh, what's happening here. Um, and which is the reason I go back to what I was saying earlier. Like this could get ugly before it gets good. Like, I mean, you're talking about potentially like derailing a, a very popular political figure. You know, yeah, that doesn't endear you as a central government generally. No, that, that's that's what I'm saying. You can look at the uh, overthrow of Mohammad Mossadegh in um, in 1953 in Iran as an example. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah I mean, because 
before that, uh, before the U S sponsored coup that overthrew Mossadegh and installed the Shah, yeah. um, the Iranians had a generally f- favorable opinion of Americans. Yeah. Um, no. and it was actually yeah. the most advanced, like that was a democratic government. Mossadegh was elected democratically. It was the most democratic, uh, um, um, government in a Muslim country. Yeah. They were like well on their way. They actually have a pretty strong democratic tradition yeah. there. Um, and they liked Americans. Yeah. But everybody in Iran now knows that mm. the U.S. government overthrew their democratically elected, very popular populist leader. Yeah. Um, and replaced him with the Shah who had a, who, you know, in, oh man, that's not the right word. Um, oversaw, I guess we'll say, yeah. a brutal 25 year dictatorship. Yeah. All right. And we were f- perfectly content with that. Yes. Like that, we, yeah, we planned we that. We supported that. Yeah. Guy. We planned that. Yeah. Um, so it, it completely shifted. Yeah. It, Same thing can happen here. Yeah. Like, you know, that led to, of course, the, the uh, um, attack on the embassy is when we lit the Shaw into the U.S. for uh, medical treatment. Oh, I, yeah. I uh, it was that. after the revolution. They'd already yeah. overthrown the Shaw. They yeah. didn't attack the American embassy until the U.S let the Shah into the U S for medical treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Months later. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and actually that's a good transition there. Cause Iran's yeah. Iran's back in the news. Yeah. I, um, we have this idea in the middle. So most of the middle East, the, the country's, um, political boundaries are, are made up. Yeah. Essentially the, 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 yeah. um, European and American, uh, colonialists drew lines without any regard to the people that live there and the various groups and sects that were already there. Yeah. So all these lines are just kind of like, yeah, not drawn the way they would have naturally been drawn. Exactly. And once you created the line, then everybody fights over the area in between them. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's not true of Iran. Yeah. Iran's one of the oldest nations on the planet. Yeah. Iran has a history going back like 2,500 years to what was it, Cyrus and like 600 BCE or something like that, yeah. that united all these, um, these warrior tribes under one nation. Yeah. Um, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't been a powerhouse during all that time, Yeah. but, but like but the roots of Iran yeah. are at least 2,500 years old. Wow. And, um, and there is a strong national pride there. Yeah. And the idea, this is, you know, this is the mistake that the U S makes all the time is that you can impose your values on another country from the outside. Yeah. You can't. Yeah. I mean, it just, it just can't be done. And in this particular case, while a lot of the Iranians may even be, um, interested in the Western way of life. Yeah. They don't want to be told how to be. Yeah. Yeah. They want it on their terms. There's still a national pride there yeah. that that bristles at uh, foreign interference. Yeah. Um, there's no point in that little brief history lesson, honestly. I, I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Well, um, it's the, interesting, though. <laughs> the So there's been talk recently about uh, Americans putting U.S. Marines on uh, merchant vessels traveling through the Straits of Hormuz next to Iran to protect them from Iran seizing ships. So uh, how, I mean, I guess just guys with guns to make sure other guys with guns don't board the ship. Exactly. Like that's the idea. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, I was going to say, cause that's not going to stop them from torpedoing it or something. No, but they're not trying but to, that, the worry is stuff. they're trying to capture stuff. Uh, okay. I follow. And, and the reason that they're trying to capture stuff is because the U S has been capturing ships, carrying Iranian oil to try and, um, maintain the uh to enforce the, sanctions. the sanctions. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. We're blockading your country. And so now you can't take stuff in or out. Right. Um, and in fact, there is a, is it Greek? I can't remember the nation that actually owns the ship, but there's a, there's a vessel off the coast of Houston right now, um, that the U S government seized that's carrying Iranian oil. Um, and they're trying to sell the U S government is trying to sell the oil to American companies and keep the profits for the U.S. government. For the government, yeah. <laughs> got, um, got to get into that six thirty-six trillion dollar deficit somehow, right? One <laughs> yeah. oil tanker at a time. <laughs> exactly. Um, 
Now, people aren't buying it. The companies, yeah. American companies aren't buying it because they're concerned about the reaction that Iran might take against their oil traveling through the Straits of Hormuz. Oh, absolutely. Which may be why the U.S. government is talking about putting Marines on these ships to protect them so the, the U.S. companies will buy the oil so the government can make the profit. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're going to spend all this money to put these troops on these ships so we can collect this little <laughs> so bit. So that we can sell the oil. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, Oh. And uh, the Iran, so the first ship seized was seized by the U.S. government. Actually, I think the first ship seized was seized by the British government, but same difference. Okay. Um, and Iran has only been seizing ships in response to seizures by other countries of their oil. And they have only been seizing ships of that belong to countries that um, were are participating with the U.S. to enforce the sanctions. Yeah. Now, here's the other thing is like once... Once you get in out into international waters, yeah. the U.S. actually has no authority to enforce their sanctions. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Like, you can't, like, I mean, because otherwise... Oh, the AC turned off. It must have gotten us down to 71 at some point. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. All right. I mean, otherwise, like, it's a legit blockade where, like, you're just not letting stuff come in and out. I mean, not that that's not what it is anyway, but... Yeah. Um, and all of this... There's no reason that we can't have positive re relations with Iran. Yeah. Uh, you know, the I, I, keep, I continue to say that the worst thing that Trump did while he was in office was withdraw from the JCPOA and um, reinstate sanctions on Iran. Well, we can't have good um, relations with Iran because of Israel. Yeah, I mean, that's... I mean, that's that's the crux to this, at least as far well, as no, I understand it. Yeah, but, but we were capable of it. Like... Yeah, so we, we were, but but like I say, you we're gonna piss off Israel by doing it, and there's just no appetite for that, at yeah. least in this country. Well, there's there's certainly truth in that. Uh, although, actually, making that agreement with Iran w was more of a problem for Saudi Arabia than it was for Israel. Really? That's why um, we entered the Yemen war or supported the Yemen war was to placate the Saudis. We didn't yeah. really do anything for Israel after that. Yeah. Um, now Israel has continued to. Uh, to bomb supposed nuclear facility. Actually, they, they have been nuclear facilities. They've just been civilian nuclear <laughs> facilities, not yeah. weapons-making facilities. Yeah. Um, and you know, of course, uh, Biden. Well, it was the it was the Obama administration that entered the JCPOA in the first place, and Biden was saying that he would re-enter it when he took office, but he didn't. Um, he left Donald Trump's maximum pressure sanctions on Iran yeah. and tried to renegotiate the treaty and get more concessions. Yeah. Which well, Iranians it, weren't really interested in that. Yeah. That's, that's not how it works. You know, like you were the ones who left. We so, were the ones who left. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Trump's maximum pressure campaign is still on. Now it's Biden's maximum pressure campaign. Yeah. And it has accomplished nothing. Yeah. Well, except for like probably making life hell for a whole bunch of civilians in yeah. Iran. Um, now there is there is some positive um, news out there too, is that there has been a discussion sup supposedly this month or next month I guess um, within the next month I think um, there's supposed to be a prisoner exchange in Doha yeah. uh, be for Americans held in Iran and Iranians held in the U S. Yeah, or held by the U S. Probably not in the U S. Yeah, yeah, that goes, but. Um, there's supposed to be a prisoner exchange, and um, the U.S. government has re agreed to release $6 billion in Iranian assets that are frozen back to Iran, um, yeah. with the caveat that the money can only be used to buy food and medicine and other essentials or something like that. I mean, yeah. but, you know, money is fungible, so yeah. it can go to whatever. At It'll that go point, where really. it goes, yeah. Now, I can just imagine, though, like just like just after the JCPOA, when the all that money was released to Iran, and, you know, you had the whole narrative of the pallets of pallets cash. Pallets of cash, yeah. Pallets of cash were just giving Iran all this money. And yeah. the way it was presented by the press was that it was like taxpayer money, yeah. that we were just paying Iran. yeah. Yeah. Um, to enter this deal when in reality it was Iranian money that the U S had frozen, yeah. um, 
for an oil deal in France, I think specifically, yeah. uh, that France had tried to pay Iran, U.S. had frozen the assets, but that, the French took the oil. Yeah, right. <laughs> they took delivery, and the money never got to Iran, and that was Iranian money that was finally released back to Iran. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't our money. And this is the same thing. It's Iranian assets that have been frozen by the U.S., that's being released back to Iran. So just prepare yourself for when it happens. For pallets of cash. Yeah. That <laughs> pallets we're, of cash That too. we're just giving Iran <laughs> billions of dollars. Yeah, yeah. No, we're not. We're, yeah, we're giving them back their money. Yeah, it's their yeah. money. <laughs> right. We're, we're unstealing it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so, but I, I mean, that is good news though. I think that this prisoner exchange is at least, you know, one of the kind of more positive ways of starting diplomatic yeah negotiations although i don't think that it'll in the end it'll go anywhere because the u.s just has a, a diplomatic attitude at this point in time where it's our way or the highway that yeah. we don't make any concessions for anybody for anything that you have to do everything our way that diplomacy is just us telling you what you will do yeah well and we only and it's have not really a negotiation another year or so of this administration anyway i don't think that it'll changes be... though with biden yeah I, I mean, I, I don't, probably I mean, not. I, like, I think that that's just. I think that's just the attitude of the of the diplomatic core of the bureaucracy uh, of the United States. Yeah, it's just ingrained in there. Yeah, yeah, oh, probably right. So that that's unfortunate, but at least uh, there's some movement. Um, of course, the concern with having Marines on these vessels is that what if there's an exchange of fire? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, mean, this is another quick way of getting into an actual shooting war with Iran. Yeah. And we don't want one. No. I mean, we would probably win. Yeah. But it won't be easy. No. Iran yeah. is big. Yeah. Iran is big. It is, it's got, uh, I, I mean, it's got a developed military. Um, well, and just like all of these wars, what would winning even look like? Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, did we win in Afghanistan? Did we win in Iraq? Like, I mean, you can say we won in Iraq. I mean, I know Bush took his little victory lap or whatever, but I don't think anybody today looking back on that thinks we won. No. And even if you do, you still think, well, but what did it really accomplish? Well, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, no, no good comes from any of that. Yeah. There's a lot more to be gained through cooperation than competition. It's always been the case. Yeah. Always will be like mm -hmm. that's like, more people benefit when there's cooperation. Yeah, you this know? is this and, is a, and, and, and a and rule this, of economics. And in this game in particular, mm -hmm. like we as the citizens win because like we we get stuff in exchange and like yeah we absolutely win in that. And for those interested, uh, look up Zoroastrianism. As the old religion of Iran, of the Persians. Oh, really? It's really interesting. Um, there's like a real strong emphasis on good government and uh, like some of the things that, that we like the best about the Declaration of Independence, that, um, that you have a right as a citizen to expect good governance and that if you're not getting it, you have the right to overthrow that government and put a new one in. Man, I wish more people... In and it's that's more, religious. It's more, like, it's not even just... It's not even like, yeah, that's like a religious call, <laughs> yeah. like, which is different from a, just a regular call. <laughs> yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. Um, you have an obligation <laughs> from the Lord. Well, that's all I have yeah. to talk about tonight. I hear you. Do you got anything so, else? Uh, I mean, nothing really big. Um, that I mean, cause we could we could talk for another five minutes or something. Yeah, what's the guy's name that put that? I've got it on my phone. I'm gonna pull it up because uh, I don't. My wanna, answer is gonna be I have no idea. I know what you. I know what your answer is. So, <laughs> um, Oliver, Oliver Anthony, that song. I know everybody's probably heard that the Richmond, um, Richmond of North Richmond. Um, I'll let you listen to it the other night. Yeah. Well, you say, you know, everybody's heard it, but you know that if you hadn't played it for me the other night, I would not have yeah, heard it. But I know you also live under a rock. So <laughs> when it comes to social media, I know a lot of things that are going on in the world that almost nobody else knows yeah. about. But <laughs> I, well, I went to pull up that song and like, so all of like, he had the top three songs on iTunes, at least that particular day. Mm -hmm. um, and then the one below that was the other one, that small town song um, by just a second, Jason Aldean, whoever that is. Yeah. I don't listen to country music. Yeah. <laughs> um, but 
I just feel like there's a shift happening. And I feel like like now, like you can kind of put a marker down, like right now, like the country's kind of changing its tune. It's kind of over all of this, uh, just left in general, the trans, like all of that type of stuff. Like this, all of this is, pu- there's pushback against it and it's real. Um, and I just feel like there's some kind of shift happening. And it's interesting that it's happening now with everything going on. When you look at Trump and you look at like just the election coming up in general, mm-hmm. I don't know. I just, I feel like there's a shift happening. I don't know what's going to happen with it. Well, I hope that the shift is that everybody realizes that both of the major parties suck. Well, here's what's interesting about <laughs> it is so like the pendulum. And then if you want things to change, I mean, every, we had to pick something else entirely. We can we can kind of all relate with the like the pendulum generally swings right to left. It's mm-hmm. a right left, right left. Well, it kind of did something a little different when Trump got elected. Because when it swung back hard right after Obama, and if you, everybody, people don't remember, but Obama was an extremist when he was elected. Like yeah. he was an extreme leftist. He's not considered that anymore, but at the time he was. Yeah, he fell in line. Yeah, <laughs> well, exactly. Um, well, and the party moved again. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but then when Trump was elected, it didn't just swing back right, it swung back hard anti establishment. Yeah. And, and, but what's interesting about the scenario we're living under and that we're going to see play out in this next election is Trump might not be the anti establishment candidate. Yeah. Who do you think it would be? RFK. Yeah. Okay. I can see that. Like it, it creates an interesting dynamic. And what I think what we're seeing now, like there's a serious pushback against the left. And I think we're going to see that in this election. And it would be so wild if that serious pushback against the left came from the left. Like, I, I, I'm not trying to predict the future here. I'm just laying out a scenario that seems very interesting going into this election, particularly with RFK, because RFK is absolutely an anti-establishment candidate. Yeah. Like you can't That's argue. so ridiculous, too, because he's a Kennedy. Because he's a Kennedy. Yeah. But it's it's wild, but... Like, I don't know. I think there's a lot to, I don't know if it's all going to be good. Like it's, yeah. we're heading for a very interesting election. Well, populist gets a bad name for some reason. I guess it's because the elites that are identifying it as such. Yeah. Um, because populist really just means the going with the will of the people. Well, that means going, that's but the majority. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it would be nice to see like a left wing populist candidate really get some traction. And a right wing populist candidate really gets some traction. It would it would be yeah. nice to see anti establishment candidates on both sides. Yeah. In the end, whether there if it's a Republican or a Democrat, I don't think that it matters. No. I, I think that if a Republican or a Democrat is elected, which almost certainly will be the case, yeah. that nothing's going to change. No. And I, if you really that's the point that I try to make to people all the time, if you're not satisfied with where this country is going or you haven't been satisfied with where this country is going for a long time, say 10 years, 20 years, well, you've had right-wing candidates and left-wing candidates. You've had right-wing administrations, left-wing administrations. If nothing's changed, if it's still going bad, maybe stop picking one of those two. Yeah. It needs, you need something different. Yeah. If you want to change, you got to change something. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Of course I advocate for the libertarian party, but at least it, ideologically, I, I, some yeah. candidates. Have, there's there's anyway. some in the weeds stuff that <laughs> yeah. kind of gets interfered there. But overall, like but, the but platform. Yeah, it's certainly yeah. preferable to the Republicans or the Democrats or yeah. any of the other third party candidates for me. But but the truth is that when I'm when I go into the polling booth um, and I start, you know, pulling the handle or whatever. Yeah. We don't really the, do the, that the metaphorical handle. Right, right. <laughs> um, and it doesn't come up jackpot on all three. Yeah. I actually pick the a third party candidate. Yeah. Uh, if there's ever a third party candidate running, yeah. I choose the third party candidate. I, it doesn't even matter if I know who they are. Yeah. I, I choose the third party candidate. And if um, in a race where there's uh, just an incumbent and somebody else, I never vote for the incumbent. Yeah. No, I'm with you. Well, we don't have any that are worthy. Yeah. At so least I, in Alabama. I mean, can, we live in Alabama. So. Like, if you're not satisfied, then don't pick the same guy again. Yeah. So if you moved to Kentucky, you're saying you wouldn't vote for the incumbent? If if I moved to Shelbyville and Thomas Massey was on my ticket, I would vote for Thomas Massey, yes. Absolutely. Um, and I would vote for Rand Paul. Absolutely. Um, this is true. 
So but, you do have but to I look. Was, so you do have to look at the candidate. Is all I'm saying. Yeah, I'm not I mean, saying there yeah. any of but them are good about, other than those two. But I was talking about moving there because the two of them are there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, so you're not going to pull that third party lover there. No, probably not. <laughs> so. Probably. Well, I don't know. It depends. I mean, like I could meet a libertarian candidate up there and be like, "No, man, this is the guy." Yeah. I mean, I have some issues with Massey and Rand Paul too. Oh, absolutely. Um, but. but they. They're the best of their particular, you know. They're absolutely the best in the Republican Party. Yeah, they're the best uh, representative and the best senator in in Congress right now. Yeah, far as I can tell. Oh, at the without, federal level. Yeah, without question. I don't think there's a whole lot of debate for that, at least amongst libertarians. So, anyway, um, all I right. Know, just interesting to think about. Like I say, there's. There's there's things happening. There's things on the foot, and society is moving in a weird way that the media is not covering. Yeah, the unfortunate thing though is I don't. I I think that we have the problem that we've had all the time, which is that the the government and the media have successfully divided the people. Yeah. So yeah, you have problems with the trans movement, but they're directed towards trans people. You have problems with immigration, but they're directed towards immigrants. They're not directed really towards the people that are the energy is not focused the where it needs to be. So. Um, and, and those people that are just people trying to live their lives, like it's not their fault is having it taken out on them. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, I agree with that. The, the political movement isn't, isn't their fault for the most part. Like the, the policy issues that you have trouble with are, are not rooted in those people. They don't have any power. Yeah. No, I wholeheartedly agree. But um you know, it's just a it's just a tried and true method of uh, maintaining authority is to, you know, divide the subordinates. Have yep. them have them focus on each other instead of on you. Yep. And and you're the answer to the problem instead of actually <laughs> being the problem, being, but when you're absolutely the problem. Yeah. And, and so. it's one of those things, like, I see people all the time that complain about capitalism, 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 all oh, these businesses, blah, 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 they do all these things. Yeah. Like, well, but how do they do those things? Yeah. I mean, how, yeah. how is it, <laughs> why is it that you have to buy insurance? Yeah. Why is it that you have to, you know, go through this particular process to get this, that, or the other? Yeah. It's because of legislation. Now, yeah. I am not going to argue that the, those companies, those businesses didn't have anything to do with that legislation. But yeah. they couldn't do these things without, without the government. The government arm, yeah, yeah. No, so absolutely. who's really the problem? Yeah, it's always the government. Yeah. <laughs> is it the authority that the government wields, or the power that the the corporations wield over government? If the yeah. government didn't have the authority, the power yeah. that they had over the government wouldn't matter. Yeah. Well, and the government can squash those companies at a hat's drop of a hat. Yeah. Well, and we've talked about that a few times on the podcast. When it when push comes to shove. Yeah, the government has the, the guns. The corporation's actually the loser. Yeah, yeah. The government has the guns. Yeah. So. But we've got the numbers. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> and the guns, really, if throw you think little, about it. Throw a little Doors reference out there at the end for everybody. Yeah. All right. So um, next week's weird, but uh, we're going to try and get together early in the week, although I'll probably just post the podcast normally. Normal time. Oh, I wanted I wanted to plug myself. All right. Um, I, I forgot to mention at the beginning. Uh, I did start a Substack. Yeah. Where it's not going to be. I'm going to try and refrain from a lot of political stuff. Yeah. Because I have this outlet. Yeah. For that, but um, I'm just going to be writing things there. Uh, culture reviews, some fiction, just kind of whatever. It's it's really for me to get back into the habit of writing regularly. Yeah. Um, and I, I need some kind of motivation to do so. And I've been thinking about doing this for a long time. And my brother started a sub stack, which I think is just called Danny Substack. So you should follow him too. He, he writes about, um, I think it's, 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 what is it? Don't like it, get better. Don't like, oh, well, that was the website that he used to have. Is that, is that think, what the sub stack is called? I think he's still now? calling it that. Okay. Yeah. So maybe that's it. Let's try don't like it, get better. Don't like it, get better. Even if he's not still posting there, there's plenty of good reads there. That's true, too. So, um, but there's a, if it's the sub stack, then you can go to sub stack and search don't like it, get better. Oh, I absolutely. Guess. Yeah. Um, that would be my brother. He writes about uh, parenthood and um, kids and goals and, uh, both like occupational and personal and so forth. And he's a good writer. It's too. good stuff. Yeah. Um, 
I'll be writing all kinds of stuff. Who knows? Yeah. I, I'm just trying to get back into the habit of writing. And no I'm real direction and, at the moment. Just yeah. putting something on paper. Yeah. Again. I mean, I have some ideas about things that I that I absolutely want to talk about uh, in terms of like how people interact with each other. Yeah. In a moral way. Yeah. Um. So that you know, there's going to be some morality, but there, but there's going to be some fiction. There's going to be just like little short essays on all kinds of topics. Who knows? Um, reviews of movies, books. Who knows? Yeah. I don't know. It's just whatever's whatever's in my head. I'm just it's trying gonna, to get back into writing. It's going to be fun. Um, I I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Um, right now I'm planning on posting just twice a week. There's one episode or one episode. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, there's one um article up so far or one blog. I don't know what you call them. Um, Substack. Anyway, there's one thing up so far. <laughs> yeah. And it's just kind of an intro talking about what I plan to do. And I'm going to have another one up tomorrow, uh, which I have mostly written. I just need to edit it to make sure it's sharp. Absolutely. But I sat down for like 35 minutes yesterday and wrote something. No, that was the day before yesterday um, that I think is going to be what I put up there. It depends on what I write today and what I write tomorrow. So yeah. Yeah. today may be better. Yeah. <laughs> I doubt it at this point, <laughs> Yeah, but we'll see. Cause uh, we're going to go eat and have margaritas after this. I'm ready. And by the time I get home, I don't know <laughs> yeah. how effective my writing will be. A little stream of consciousness may be great though. Who knows? Absolutely. Anyway. So uh, mine's called, uh, Michael's meditations. Yeah. Um, I wanted it to be Michael's musings, but some other Michael got to it first and used that alliterative title. <laughs> some other Michael is musing. Yeah. So it's meditations instead. Yeah. Um, and the URL is uh, Michael's meditation. Okay. Uh, like substack.com Michael's meditation. I don't remember what the structure is of those things. Yeah. But yeah, again, you can go to substack and, and look up Michael's meditations and, and subscribe. Absolutely. It's free. You yep. can also pay me if you want to, but... <laughs> it's strictly voluntary. It's strictly voluntary. <laughs> As it should be. So that was a nice long plug at the end. I'd spent more time on that than I meant to. But yeah. uh, anyway, so we're going to try and get together early next week and get a recording down. Um, probably post it at the regular day on Thursday. We were a little late this week because it just Life. didn't work out Thursday, didn't work out Friday. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, we'll, we'll, we expect to get an episode up next Thursday. And... Um, so in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook, subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, Twitter. No, Twitter, not Facebook. Yeah, we don't use Twitter. Podbean. Yeah. Or Some X or whatever they call it now. Yeah, there is no Twitter anymore. That's it's right. It's all X, yep. Um, and uh, yeah, like and share, comment, uh, you know, tell your friends. You can always email me at michael at com, or, you know, send private messages on, or direct messages or whatever they call them on Facebook. Yep. Um, comments on youtube etc i read them uh thanks big red beard for the comment on the last interview i saw it i i almost texted you because i actually know you uh, <laughs> i didn't because i'm lazy sorry anyway yeah. uh but we'll be back next week when we finally get this right and in the meantime try to stay free life short live free ciao later